Hey everybody, my name is John. Uh, I'm the founder of Bristol Cop Watch, a police monitoring group, a new police monitoring group in Bristol. And I'm also the managing director of Future Band IT, an IT startup. Um, you might have got a couple of web presentations, basically, full cap on digital activism and online security. Just to give you a quick overview of my background, if you haven't before, you don't know who I am. Uh, basically, I've worked in the IT sector for over 10 years. Uh, I'm a unified communication specialist. I'm also branching more into uh, network security. I'm certified with uh, a global leader in IT security, ESET. Uh, for network security and in terms of community activism, I've uh, been involved in presentations such as this, basically with uh, the awesome and formidable Privacy International, uh, looking at online security, our privacy rights and police surveillance technology as well. So obviously this is a subject that's very close to my heart. What I've done today is I've got together a whistle-stop tour of digital activism online security. So just moving on to my first slide today, uh, just explaining why online security or our own personal security and privacy matters uh, in terms of just sort of general internet use and digital security. Um, I feel that it's important just to understand uh, that governments and security services and of course the police can profile us basically for our social media uh, and our internet use. Devices that we're using every day, everyday life, have become weaponized. So when I'm talking about devices, I'm talking about my mobile phone. I'm talking about the PC that I, uh, I use for home use and I work from. I'm talking about my iPad, those sort of devices. And obviously the same is going to apply to yourselves. Um, surveillance technology in general is a threat to privacy and other things, fundamental rights and freedoms. And what we found historically is that the uh, privacy rights of ourselves as citizens are often undermined basically in the interest of national security. So when we look at how the police operate, how the intelligence services operate, and obviously other state agencies and actors operate online, we find ourselves at the bottom of the pile. And so it's obviously again down to ourselves to, uh, you know, to ensure that we're secure when we're browsing the internet or we're involved in any sort of digital activism, whatever that may be, especially if you're involved uh, with an organization like CAT and you're doing positive work. Uh, for a positive cause. Basically, one of the main issues we face is online interactions. Today, in other words, what our interactions are on social media, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Twitter, any of those sort of channels, have become inseparable from our day-to-day -day lives. And unfortunately, what the police in particular will often do is profile us based on our online activity. And I say the police, it's not just the police, it's obviously organisations like GCHQ and the intelligence services, if you're a person of interest, they'll watch what you're saying and you're doing on the internet just as much as they may be watching you offline. So just moving on to the next slide, what is online security? Well, I've just touched on, you know, why online security matters, but what it is exactly? What, what is it exactly even? Well, mass surveillance is a term that we've heard historically, again, probably over the past eight or nine years, obviously since the Edward Snowden revelations uh, and the exposure of, you know, national, uh, the NSA and of course GCHQ here and their surveillance programmes. Mass surveillance effectively is indiscriminate surveillance for population. Everybody is a suspect, everybody could be doing wrong, everybody should be watched just so the state knows what's going on. So basically to defend our digital rights, privacy and private lives, we should all practice good online security. We should develop almost a best practice as you would do within a company or organization for network security. So maybe just take a minute just to ask yourselves the following questions. How can I interact with sites safely? How can I protect my privacy and identity and contacts and association? And what information do I want to keep private and who do, do I want to keep it from? So again, just to reiterate, how can I protect my own privacy online? And how can I protect my identity and contacts and my associations? And what information do I need to keep private? And you know, who am I really keeping that private from? So obviously, in my personal life, that may be slightly different from you know digital activism. There may be different kind of 
what we consider to be threat actors in both instances. But in general, it's good to ask ourselves these questions just so you know we know that we're secure online and we're looking out for our, our rights basically as citizens and our own privacy rights even. Just moving on to the, the next slide. Web browsing obviously is something that we do daily. Um, you know, we browse the web at home, we browse the web uh, you know, at work, we browse the web on our mobile phones. It's, it's probably the most common way to, to access you know, the internet and just to visit the sites we want to. Of course, when you're browsing the internet, it's worth remembering that your service providers, uh, that's your BCs and your Virgins or, or whatever company you've chosen to use, can see where you're visiting. Yeah, they can see the sites that you go to, uh, and they can see obviously where you're where, where you're going on those websites, unless you're on a banking website, but we'll come to that in a moment. In the same respect, so can somebody who's snooping or spying on your internet activity. So that's where HTTPS everywhere comes in. Now you might be asking yourself, what exactly is HTTPS everywhere? Well, basically, HTTPS HTTPS everywhere is a Firefox, Chrome and Opera extension. And it basically encrypts your communications with many major websites. So going back to what I said uh, a moment ago, just about banking websites. If you go onto your banking website now, you should notice when you punch in the website, the code, the uh, address bar has changed to HTTPS and there should probably be a padlock on the uh, on the actual address bar. So basically what this means is you're now on banking level encryption. In other words, even though your service provider or someone who's maybe snooping on your web traffic can see that you've landed on a banking website, what they can't see is what you're doing. In other words, on a banking website, you're logging into your account. You don't want that information publicly exposed. And in the same respect, what HTTPS does, and it is a free extension, is encrypts all the communications with many major websites. So every site you visit becomes HTTPS encrypted and it's high level encryption. It really will protect your internet journey. And so to encrypt the web, encrypt your browsing experience, you should install HTTPS everywhere today. And if you Google that or you're on Opera or any other browser, you'll be able to find the link and you can just install, install the extension from there. And also the really good thing is it's included in Tor, uh, or the infamous Onion browser. It's also included in Brave, which I love and will come to next. And it's also these days included in Microsoft Edge as well. And it's very, very simple to, to install. All you need to do, again, is just follow the, uh, follow the link on your search and it will just give you clear instructions how to install that plugin. Going back to uh, browsers, what I mentioned there uh, was Brave as a preference. So what is Brave? Uh, Braze, personally, is my browser of choice. Uh, the issues we find with websites is that websites will often track us for our software and they'll try to identify us, basically. Um, this will basically be via ad trackers. This may be via other tracking measures that are in place, and you know, such as cookies, that kind of stuff. So Brave basically will block all of that. It will allow us to browse freely and safely on the internet. Brave also has got Tor installed, uh, and that's basically for secure browsing in the private window. So if you go onto your Google browser and you take a look and you want to, and you want to browse privately, you can, you'll always have the in private browsing option there. It's exactly the same with Brave, but Brave is using the Tor network to keep yourself extra secure. And of course, blocking ads as well and trackers doesn't just make for a more secure internet experience, it makes for a faster internet experience as well. And if you're living in a, uh, a regime, if you will, where your internet's being censored, Brave, just like Tor, is a really good browser just to circumvent internet censorship. Uh, so in other words, I may not be able to visit any you know, sort of some of the websites, some sort of some countries will even block Facebook, you know. I may not even be able to visit Facebook, but I can if I use Brave. And if you just want to say really secure and very private, uh, a lot of journalists who do investigative journalism work like this, Brave's a great browser as well, just to say extra secure 
um, rather than just having to install tool. You might be wondering at this stage, why is it so important to be secure outside of uh, sort of general, you know, your general browsing experience, something that we've run over already. You know, why should I worry so much about my, uh, my, my internet privacy, my internet security? I'm not doing anything wrong. As I mentioned, mass surveillance is indiscriminate. It watches everybody. GCHQ troll hundreds of social media profiles and hundreds of thousands and millions or probably billions of social media profiles and internet journeys. And of course, they look for people they consider to be of interest to them. And so we have every right to remain secure. One of the other reasons we should be thinking about privacy is because of SOTMIN. SOTMIN is basically a security services and in particular police social media monitoring tool. It's effectively the what they call, some would call the bastard child of OPSIN, which is open source intelligence gathering. Open sourcing is what it says on the tin. It's information, it's looking for information on us that's freely available. If I was to write, say, uh, an investigative journalist piece, if I was to maybe do public speaking, anything like that, open source intelligence would help withdraw from the information it found from those sources to help profile me. Whereas SOP, SOPMIN is a lot more intrusive and it's a lot more personal. SOPMIN is basically monitoring and gathering of information on social media platforms. And it can even monitor you if you have a, a very private social media profile, or maybe a closed profile on Facebook, or maybe a uh, private Twitter or private Instagram. If the police want to, they can monitor you, you know, within, within that uh, social media environment, if you will. So it basically includes content scraping. Effectively, what you say on Facebook or what you say on any social media channel, if watched by Saltman, is kept forever. We all know that Facebook store information for a great deal of time on their servers. Saltman effectively just scrapes the data from websites like that and it will use it to form an intelligence profile of you. And of course, what it includes as well is snooping. So the police may just watch your Facebook. They may just watch your Twitter. They may just watch your Instagram. If you're somebody they consider to be a person of interest. And these days, a person of interest, just like the term domestic extremist, was, was previously, has always been a very, very broad term. What we consider to be, you know, forward thinking and progressive, the state will consider to be a potential political threat. And of course, the police will often see us in the, uh, in the same light as well. So as I mentioned already, data collection uh, can also often land for profile generation or intelligence profile generation of us. And unfortunately, in terms of privacy and the laws around sort of men, there is no transparency and the law really isn't that clear. But one thing I do know is that, you know, what we share on our social media profiles or what we share on the internet or the sites we visit certainly shouldn't be fair game to put us in a bracket as whatever the police may position us as being. And historically as well, Sockman is a tool that has been used against protesters. There was actually a company over in America, uh, a private intelligence company, who profiled black and mass activists when uh, unfortunately somebody was murdered at the hands of the police, was shot and killed. And on their funeral, there was a lot of Black Lives Matter hashtags. And in fact, what happened was those hashtags were monitored and the people that were then sharing the hashtags on Facebook, Facebook even, were then basically classed as what, was, what, what is known as a threat actor. That information was passed on to the police and the state and the police in America actually acted on this and they raided home simply because somebody was sharing the Black Lives Matter hashtags. Now we live in a, a crazy, unfair and unjust world but it is, worth, it is worth noting if you're going out protesting, if you're going out on the streets and demonstrations, that's great. We all need to do that, especially right about now. But do be mindful that that can draw the attention of the police and obviously you know, of the state in general. And even if you're just sharing news articles, you know, you could find yourself in a position where you'll be monitored uh, by this particularly insidious tool. So again, it was previously used by the Mets Domestic Extremism Unit. And that's, from what I understand, I think the may not be defunct. I think the term is now aggravated activist. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting one, but obviously that applies to many different people from Stop the Badger Call to Cat 
to you know to organisations uh, that are basically going out and trying to do the right thing to fight for our rights and civil liberties as well. It's collecting both private and public data, whereas Opsin is focusing primarily on um, information in the public domain. Sotman is able to go right inside your profile if the police have the authorization and watch you based on what you think is a reasonably safe and secure environment. So without wanting to feel the flames of paranoia, it's always worth thinking about, you know, what if you think that you may be under surveillance, just thinking about well, thinking about what you're saying and what you're sharing online. So moving on to the next slide, this uh, quite appropriately why we need to keep a secure social media profile. Social media intelligence, again, as we just covered, is a complete invasion of our privacy. Do you ask yourself, basically, when you're on a social media platform, such as Facebook, on Twitter, or Instagram, just ask yourself if you want to use details that are going to identify you directly, or if maybe you want to use a fake profile name, uh, or maybe just make a completely clean profile with no work contacts on, no friends and family on, you know? It's always worth thinking about that, especially if you're doing a lot of online activism. Um, your IP address as well may be logged on registration. So as I've mentioned already, it's worth thinking about a VPN or virtual private network. Um, in my day-to-day -day working life, I use a VPN uh, simply because of the sort of clients that I'm dealing with and the sort of organisations that I work with. I just need to make sure uh, that everything is completely secure. So we're going back running the sat now. So you know, it's uh, it's a subject uh, that's uh, probably a, a workshop in its own right. But it's worth just looking into that. And you can subscribe to different VPN services. Uh, ExpressVPN is one that I recommend. So maybe that's worth worth looking into further. And also, aside from VPN, just always worth, of course, choosing a strong password and not using a password that consistently replicates itself on different platforms you use and on uh, different, you know, different social media. Uh, it's also worth as well checking the site's privacy policy and just securing your privacy settings. So my Facebook is a closed profile. Okay, so from the all intents and purposes, anyone who's not my friends list can't just run them. They have themselves, they have to know somebody that I know and my friends list and likes and dislikes and everything else is hidden as well as my timeline is hidden from anyone else unless they are added by myself anyway. It's a nice way just to keep your, your, your internet secure, your, your Facebook profile nice and secure as well. But obviously going back to sort of men, if you're somebody the, uh, the cops or the state who consider to be a person of interest they want to, they can certainly get through um, you know, that, level of, that level of protection. But do check the privacy policies and make sure you're nice and secure on all social media sites. You can make yourself secure on Twitter too. So just moving on to uh, rise up an email, as well as looking at social media and how we communicate and what we say there, it's worth looking at uh, mailing so email services as well. Rise up is a very popular service uh, with activist groups and social movements. Bristol Cop Watch uses Rise Up email. Rise Up uh, has what we call full disk encryption. So everything is very secure on their servers. Email storage is uh, encrypted and your user ID is always hidden. And also Rise Up runs everything through the Tor IBM browser. So that's probably one of the best VPN services out there. And then traffic in that respect is always encrypted, you know, when and where possible as well. And most importantly, when on Rise Up, your internet address is not locked and your location is never disclosed. And Rise Up are a good bunch of people. Uh, they're very, uh, they're very aware of the issues around privacy and security. Uh, so they don't ask that you sign up with a phone number or any personal details. And to get a Rise Up account, you need to know somebody who has Rise Up, basically. If you're looking for a really secure way to kind of collaborate um, with whatever project you're involved with, Google Documents is a very popular one, but Google Documents, from my opinion, isn't as secure as it could be. Rise Up Pad is something that's worth considering. And Rise Up Pad basically is completely secure. And also, most importantly, again, it's on tour. So um, you're looking at a high level of encryption and you're looking at keeping all your data nice and safe. Okay, so 
we've moved from online security onto email security. And obviously what we need to think about as well is mobile security. Mobile security is, uh, again, a lengthy subject. We're just keeping it nice and concise. Uh, the states of events of mobile devices is something basically that affects every one of us in all of our, you know, every, every day walk of life, regardless of what we're doing uh, and the, the movements we're involved with or the sort of the work we do, the jobs we do, mobile phones are effectively a walking surveillance mask, especially if you have your location services turned on. So whatever phone you use, I would suggest quite strongly you get to know that device. Just be aware of location tracking. Just be aware of malware that can get onto your phone. If you're going out on a demonstration, be aware that the police use what are known as IMSI catchers, which simulate cell phone towers. And that means effectively what you can do, what they can do is eavesdrop on your text and calls and even pretend to be people that you know and, uh, and contact you directly and you assume when you text you for a number that you trust. So it's worth just thinking about those sort of things, especially in this day and age, if you go on a demonstration with the rules around demonstrations and marches getting a lot tighter and a lot more unfortunately authoritarian. Also, when it comes to uh, mobile phone security, it's always worth thinking about updating uh, your operating system. Just be aware of, uh, as I said, be aware of malware. Keep your phone up to date. I always keep my iPhone up to date. Um, I even have a Norton security uh, app on my phone that tells me when things are at risk and when my, my phone is updating. And again, going back to protests, uh, on a march or any sort of protest, it's always worth using what we call a burner. So words, a cheap phone just to talk to your friends on or group of friends that you can get rid of within the demonstrations. So even if the police are using uh, IMSI catches, then you know it isn't a phone you're going to you're going to uh, use again, kind of thing. And this doesn't mean that you're going out to do anything illegal, despite what the statements say. This does mean that you're just worried about being spied on. We don't want to have our calls even dropped on our texts, our, our text search, and anything like that. Basically, we're just staying secure. And obviously, you know, we see, we know these days, especially in terms of demonstrations and how the, um, the law is tightening tight up the bill. All of us now, just for expressing our right to protest and, protest and having freedom of speech, can potentially be seen as a threat to the state. I would say, well, we're on the subject of mobile phones, it's worth considering messaging apps and secure messaging apps. So I would suggest using Signal. Now, Signal is the gold standard of mobile phone messaging. Signal, the link to Signal is uh, in, the, in the slide here, and you should be able to download that on your Android. On, I think it's on Google Play or the store there for Android. I know it's the same with the iPhone. It's on the, uh, the iPhone app store. It's free, it's open source, and as I've said, it is the gold standard of secure messaging services. You have end-to-end -end encrypted video, audio messages, uh, and it's generally state-of-the-art technology. And so far, um, despite what you may have heard in the press, it's not actually been breached. So I say to all my friends, just like in the, uh, the image you hear, basically, if you want to message me and we're talking about police monitoring or anything, anything like that, just message me on Signal. So that in itself, is the end of my presentation. Thanks so much again for your time. I know that we've got for a lot. I know as always, there's probably quite a lot to take in. If you have any further questions, I'm happy to fill them. Maybe drop uh, an email, they can get in contact with me and I'll, I'll, I'll quite happily get back to you. In the meantime, do remember to go and sign nobody who's watching and do remember to text an email like it's gonna be ready and call Sunday. Thanks very much.